This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Uh, welcome to Unsilo. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with Ken Wilcox, who is the former CEO of Silicon Valley Bank and the author of a couple books. This one is called uh, Leading Through Culture, uh, How Real Leaders Create Cultures That Motivate People to Achieve great things. And, and you've got a new book coming out, Ken. What, what's this new book called? Oh, uh, this new book is called um, One Bed, Two Dreams, which is actually a translation of a phrase commonly used by people on the street in China. It probably is obvious what it means. <laughs> yeah, well, um, we'll have a chance hopefully to talk about that book. You mentioned a little bit towards the end of Leading Through Culture about your experiences in, in China, your unique experiences in China. But but maybe we'll start by just digging into this this book, Leading Through Culture. At some point in, in the book, you mentioned that when you spent time at Harvard Business School, uh, you, you spent a lot of time learning about strategy, right? And, you know, and Harvard, of course, is known as the, the place where strategy was more or less invented, right, as an academic discipline, and it's integral to the uh, MBA education um, but we also know that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast, as, uh, you know, Drucker said once. Um, and, and so, you know, when you decided to write this book, I think part of the motivation was to reemphasize the importance of, of culture and how, you know, the leader's job is primarily to shape, shape the culture. I mean, certainly not to neglect strategy, but, but you know, that, that cultural – curation, cultural construction, and cultural maintenance was really the, the key job of, of the leader, particularly the, the CEO. Um, and, and you also mentioned that, you know, most of the books out there, the business books were, you know, had some deficiencies, right? <laughs> you know, you don't write a book if you think the book's already been written. So, you know, maybe what were some of the, the, the weaknesses of, of, of the books? If, would you like to, to have had this book when you first started out? I mean, because you, you also talk about some of the stumbles and mistakes that you made in your early career. That's an excellent question. I really do wish I'd had that book at the onset. When I became CEO of Silicon Valley Bank in 2001, one of my good friends who ended up being on the board later, Felda Hardiman, uh, a longtime partner at Bessemer, called me up and he said, I'm so happy to see that you're going to be CEO of Silicon Valley Bank. You realize you're the least likely candidate for the job. And I, at that point in time, I have to admit, I was terrified because I had no idea how to be a CEO. I'd been in management for sure, but management and being CEO are, I think, really two different things. So I um, immediately started thinking about potential role models and realize that I actually hadn't hadn't had good role models, at least in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So I uh, started reading books on the on the uh, side and uh, talking to a couple of consultants. And over time, I started the practice of journaling. I'd um, every couple of nights I'd sit down and I'd write about the situations we were facing, the decisions we were making. And then periodically, I would uh, take out an entire evening, review the month or two prior, and make some comments to myself about what had worked and what I'd wished we'd done differently. In the course of 10 years as CEO, I collected close to a 1,000 pages. And at the end of that, I decided I'd work on this book because, and this may surprise you a little bit, uh, make me look a little naive, but I actually had thought at the time that I'd invented the phrase that culture eats strategy for lunch. Later, I <laughs> that Drucker had. <laughs> His book was not one of those I'd read in preparation. But I do feel that um, strategy is much more important, excuse me, that, um, that culture is much more important than strategy. I think it's underestimated. So um, you, you uh, asked me about, um, or you mentioned my um, background at um, Harvard Business School some 40 years ago. It felt like, and it turned out in retrospect, what I felt was actually accurate. It felt like all the courses were designed to teach somebody who was going to be a CEO, and they were all headed in the direction of strategy. The one or two courses that we had on culture 
um, in the uh, Department of Behavioral, um, Organizational Behavior were not well respected by the students at the time. And um, a lot of people thought they were just kind of a joke. But as soon as I got to be CEO, I began to realize that culture was really, I believe, much more important than strategy. And the reason I say that is you can, you can hire good people to help you build the strategy. You cannot hire good people to help you build, build the culture. That's something that has to emanate from the CEO, I believe. And uh, the other thing about that is that if you have a good strategy, but a poor culture, you're not going to do well. Yeah. On the well, other thing, it... if you have a great uh, culture and a, maybe a poor strategy, you can always bring some st uh, strategic thinkers on board, either in the form of employees or consultants, and they can help you create a much better strategy. Yeah, I mean, I think in, in business schools now, I mean, we do spend time talking about what makes for a good culture and what makes for a bad culture. But what I think is more difficult is, you know, the how to, right? So, you know, oh, yeah. you, you kind of know it when you see it, but then how do you, how do you create it, right? Like, how do you actually take actions to, particularly if you're starting off with it, with a culture that, that's not very good, you know, how do you make that, that, that transition? And I don't think anybody has sort of a, a how to uh, manual, um, particularly because I think, you know, you mentioned sort of the, the, the Peter principle, <laughs> you know, I don't know whether you actually use the term, but you, you talk about how, you know, promotion is, is usually right. Seen as a reward for, for performance in, in a role. And, uh, but it, it, it put, then puts you in a position right, that, that is very different from the, the role that you've uh, shown yourself to be good at. Right. Well, that's exactly right. Most people who get to be CEO, as you say, are promoted into that because they've done extremely well in a prior role, but that role didn't necessarily involve leadership. So they may uh, wake up one morning and find that their CEO would not really know what to do, although most people would never, ever admit that. So you wouldn't really know that that was the case. Now, you talked about how you made some mistakes in terms of people you hired and, and people you, you promoted. Um, and it took time for you to learn how to identify the, the kind of people that you wanted to have kind of surrounding you. So, you know, what were those mistakes and, and how did you, how did you learn from the mistakes? Sure. Um, I'd also like to go back to your question uh, about where do you start? How do you create a culture? Let me begin with that first, and then I'll answer your other question about mistakes I'd made in hiring. And I will have to say, CEOs in general make a lot of mistakes in hiring. I wasn't alone in that regard. But the um, answer to your question, which is a long one, and I'll only make, give you a short answer, how do, where do you begin? You actually have to begin with yourself because the culture will ultimately emanate from you. I've isolated, in my mind anyway, three important factors to consider if you're the CEO or if you want to be a CEO for that matter. And those are what are the key aspects of good leadership? Three things, I think. One is the best leaders, in my opinion, and I've looked at a lot of leaders in order to come to this conclusion, are aware of the fact that they're being copied. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've heard of the shadow of the leader concept because that's not new with me. But I don't think most leaders realize the extent to which they're being copied. Um, if they wish, they could um, experiment. You could start uh, doing simple things and watch to see the extent to which people copy you. Yeah, you talked about people. You talked about people wearing, you know, ter certain types of ties. <laughs> Everybody yeah, starts exactly. wearing those ties. Well, that happened at Silicon Valley Bank in 19. 93, we got a couple of uh, new additions to the executive team. These were guys around 40 years old, and they um, palled around together, and they came up with the idea of wearing Warner Brothers ties. And literally, of course, we were only a few hundred people at the time, but literally within a couple of months, every male in the organization had a Warner Brothers tie. And we all looked kind of silly, I felt, but even I had one. Mm -hmm. So that's number one is realizing that you're being copied and bearing the burden 
of being copied. It actually has much more profound, um, uh, a much more profound impact than what kind of tie you wear. Uh, the truth is, if you're mean spirited and uh, try to dominate through manipulation and intimidation, you'll find that most of the people in your organization will gravitate in that direction. That's, I think, one of the um, the key aspects of good leadership is looking yourself in the mirror and saying, how am I going about this? Because however I go about it, people are going to copy me. The second one is vision. Um, great leaders, this has been true throughout history. You can prove it to yourself by reading biographies of great leaders, or you can just look at some of the CEOs in the market today. Great leaders have a vision. They're generally speaking, not focused on the present. They delegate most most mm -hmm. of the responsibility for what happens today and tomorrow to their management team. But most of them are looking into the future and saying, where is it I would like us to go and how will we get there? And sharing that over and over and over again with um, the management team and with the entire corporation. And the third thing is that I think great leaders realize they can't do it all by themselves. They build themselves a management team and then they use that management team to inform them before they make a decision. Uh, and I think it's one thing that's really key here is who makes the decisions. I think good CEOs delegate most decisions downward mm -hmm. and focus on only the, the really big decisions that have to do with long-term direction. Right. And so it's like yeah. subsidi subsidiarity, I think we call it, right? And it's like, right. you know, ol only do the thing that you are the only person who, have, who can, you know, do it, right? Exactly. But then the problem is that most CEOs don't really, when they come into the job, they're not quite sure how to go about this. Who's going to make the big decision? Do mm -hmm. I do it? Or do we vote on it? Or what do we do? And the two extremes are on, on the one end of the spectrum, it would be voting, which is you can't do that. You simply can't do that. Corporations are not democracies. If you, if you make a bad decision and you go to your board and say, you know, I'm sorry, but I had to go in that direction because the team voted on it. Um, you're a candidate for replacement. But at the other end of the spectrum is being highly dictatorial and operating in a vacuum. And that's just as dangerous because good leaders realize they can't really do it by themselves. They need the advice and counsel of people with a, with a skin in the game, which would presu presumably be many of their direct reports, but also with um, people who have expertise that's important. So when they make a big decision, and they only make big decisions, uh, they seek the advice and counsel of experts and stakeholders and take yeah. it really seriously. But then they end up making the decision because it's, it's not a democracy. The other uh, temptation some CEOs face is, uh, is veering in the direction of consensus. But really, that's an illusion. There is no such thing. Uh, you can seek consensus and never get there. And if you actually get there, you probably don't have consensus. You have a lot of people pretending. Yeah, I mean, you cite, you, you quote uh, King Cyrus, right? Of Persia, yeah. diversity in council, unity and command. And, you know, I have a slide in, in one of my decks that, that says just that, but I, I didn't, I thought I came up with it. <laughs> now I got to quote Ken Wilcox or I got to quote, you know, King Cyrus, right? So uh, it goes way, way back. But I, I, I love, I love this distinction. The, the challenge, of course, is, right, if you're going to seek out input, how do you make sure you're getting the, the honest input and not the input that people think you want to hear? I mean, you had this great example of one of your predecessors with the sock puppet. I mean, that, that <laughs> maybe you could tell us a story about the sock puppet, but I mean, I mean, I guess whatever works, but, but, you know, how do you, how do you know how to get honest input rather than the, the kind of flattery and, and stuff that, that, you know, most CEOs typically get from their subordinates? That is an excellent question. And it actually goes in two different directions. One is um, 
in answer to your question about why we CEOs often miss hire, we hire the wrong people. But it also goes to the other question you just posed, and that is, how do you know you're getting honest feedback? Part of it is trying to make sure that the people that you're either interviewing on the one hand, but let's leave that aside for a minute, the people on your team are adults, are people that understand that adults have different opinions, that all the opinions may be val valuable to one degree or another, and that the way to solve problems with other adults is to have good discussions where people are being honest without being bossy. There are really two kinds of people, or three kinds of people, I should say, that you could bring onto a management team. There are adults, and those are the people you should seek. But there are also bullies, and there are also passive-aggressive people. I put the adults. Yeah, I love this spectrum. Uh, this is a great spectrum. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this spectrum. Did, now, did you find it? Did, did you figure out who made that up before you did? Because I, I love this uh, spectrum. You know, I, have. I think that one I might have actually made up. I'm not okay. sure. And it's a little bit simplistic, but we have this spectrum. We have the adults in the middle. At one end, we have the bullies. At the other end, we have the passive aggressive people. The, you try to um, coach the people at the ends to the middle. And if you can't get them there, you really ask them to go work for a competitor um, because they're, they're a distraction and they are not helping the bullies are the people that seek to get their opinion recognized and accepted through intimidation or manipulation. And the passive aggressive people are the people that are constantly smiling and nodding. They're hard to find. The bullies are easy to find because they're so noisy. Uh, but the, the passive aggressive people, when we speak with somebody who's passive aggressive, and share our opinions and they smile and nod, we tend to think they're really smart. Um, <laughs> but it may be that they just aren't willing to tell you that they have a different opinion because they're afraid. The other thing you can do, which is really, really important in discussions with your management team or with any group uh, from which you're soliciting feedback that will help you make a decision, is to withhold your opinion till the end of the discussion so that people won't deliberately copy you. But also you can't, it's a huge mistake to um, show unhappiness or disfavor toward people who say things that ultimately you're not in, in agreement with because people are really good at uh, predicting your direction and at trying to please or avoid confrontation. So people will ultimately agree with you. Um, and then you won't get good information. You'll just get a, a mere, mere image of your own opinion. Right. Now, how do you know, right? So, you know, you said it's relatively easy to know kind of who, who the bullies are and so forth. But, but it, it seems like, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's not that easy because people exhibit different behaviors when they are managing up versus uh, managing down. And, you know, one of the things that I, I, I've had a little bit of trouble with in your book was you said, you know, don't, don't come to me and complain about your boss, right? You know, sort it out with your boss. But then, you know, if, if you have that kind of rule in place, how do you ever, you know, find out about, you know, who are the bad apples? Um, if, if there's no, if you're not doing any kind of like, you know, deep dive, intelligence into the, you know, how these, how these folks are performing. I think that's an, a, a really um, excellent question. And it's also a difficult one. Um, by the way, by um, my uh, insistence that um, people should not come to me and complain about their boss is um, I think it has a different uh, rationale than um I would infer from what you just said. I think it's really important that you encourage people to work things out. Of course, if they can't work things out, ultimately yeah. you're going to have to take sides in one way or another. But um, you don't want to be the you don't want to be the mom or dad getting in <laughs> getting in the middle of all the different squabbles, right? You want to teach people to you know sort things out as grownups. But you're saying that as a 
as a as a last gap gas measure, you need you need to have some system in place for for identifying you know when there are these intractable problems. Right, you do. Um, but one of the ways that we learn about other people, um, at least at Silicon Valley Bank when I was there, was that we had a um, we had a system in place that um, involved peer review. So um, if we were, by the way, um, uh, by example, rather, if we were by example um, in the process of deciding on bonuses, annual bonuses, and um, you were one of the people in question up for a bonus, I would, and you reported to me, I wouldn't decide that solely by myself. I would convene a group of people who have contact with you on a regular basis. And I would ask them, how do you interface with them? How do you, uh, they feel about the way you treat them? And, and um, in that way, you gather a huge amount of information and uh, people end up taking it quite seriously because in that era, I'm not quite sure if they did that after I um, uh, quit being CEO, but in that era, we would base about half of your bonus on the way you work with other people. Because the way you treat other people and the way you work together with them has a tremendously big impact on the corporation, on the corporation's ability to satisfy clients, to create solutions to problems that clients have. And so it, it really was a business issue as much as it was a question of interpersonal relations. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I found that people who are capable of working together with peers on teams to create solutions for clients have always done a better job of keeping the clients happy. Therefore, it was obviously good for the bottom line. But at the same time, there's also a question of what kind of a corporation do you want to have? I don't, I want my a corporation that I would lead to consist of people who showed respect for each other showing you're not showing respect for another person if you bully them but you're also not showing respect for another person if you pretend to be in agreement with them when you're not and then ultimately sabotage things later or diss them when they're not in the room yeah it drives me absolutely nuts when people uh, agree with me just to <laughs> just to kind of you know move things along it, it it probably drives me a lot more nuts than than them disagreeing with me but um, but just you know, I think most people are only familiar with Silicon Valley Bank because of recent events. But I think it's important to kind of go back in time and you know highlight how incredibly successful Silicon Valley Bank was, right? And it really became this this unique uh, bank, right? I mean, a lot of banks are just sort of carbon copies of other banks, and and Silicon Valley Bank really did you know operate in in a different way. And 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 I've always thought of it as having a very different strategy. But, you know, is was the culture unique? I mean, there, there are a couple exa a couple items that you highlighted about how, you know, at some of these other banks, the, the salespeople and the credit people, you know, they, they were on different planets and they, they didn't talk to each other. So, you know, was was the way in which you kind of organized all the different functions and the way in which you organized the teams, was this made possible by this unique culture, how, how can culture get in the way of proper assignment of, 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 uh, of tasks and, and roles and, and, you know, rewards and so forth? Well, that's really true. The, the two have to be integrated. They have to complement each other, culture and strategy, if you want to be successful. Let me speak to the strategy in a big picture sense very briefly, and then talk about the culture and the way that it enabled us to execute on the strategy more effectively than we would have otherwise. Strategically, um, the only strategy decisions that I personally uh, made were at the very beginning of my 10 years as a CEO. And basically, they were this. Um, number one was Prior to my being CEO for the first 20 years of Silicon Valley Bank, we had what we called a three-legged stool strategy, which meant that a third of our business was going to be in the technology sector, primarily startups, but also companies that um, 
had started with us as startups and had grown large. And the one third was going to be real estate. Um, and one third was going to be Main Street, basically all other. That was the strategy that we had for fundamentally the first 20 years. But the problem with it, from my point of view, was the only thing that made us unique was working with technology companies in general and startups in particular. And that was something that we did really well and differently from anybody else. For the most part, the other 6,000 banks ignored it or avoided it because they felt that it was way too risky. But we, we found the formula and did a really good job with it and did throughout the entire history from that point on to the end. What brought Silicon Valley Bank down in the end, which is of course another story, had nothing to do with um, the market that we were addressing. Sometimes people mistakenly say, oh, the problem was they had too many yeah. technology companies, but that's not, that really is a, a misunderstanding. It, it was a different problem altogether. But so we, my big decision at the very beginning was let's get rid of two thirds of our customers, those in real estate and those on Main Street. In other words, every other kind of company and focus only on technology. That was a huge decision. Um, but it, it, it formed the basis for our strategy going forward. The other two aspects of the strategy were, let's take this bank internationally. Uh, because if you're going to do well in technology, you have to have an international orientation because technology is an around the world sort of a thing. And you can't be cutting edge in one geography without being cutting edge in all geographies. So it's, it's one of the few businesses that's truly global. And the third um, uh, thing we decided to do, which was probably the, the least momentous of the three, was to not focus so much exclusively on uh, startups. Prior to my being CEO, when startups uh, got to be about 25, 30, 35 million in sales, we graciously allowed them to gravitate toward a bigger bank. So we decided that we would invest several hundred million dollars in products so that we could keep uh, companies happy as, as long as they continued to grow. In other words, until they died or got acquired. Um, so that was the strategy. Um, the culture, I would describe quite a bit differently. And the culture supported the strategy in a way that the cultures of many other banks would not. Um, part of the culture was this whole idea that we expect employees to be focused on supporting each other and on supporting clients. Support each other because if we compete against each other, and you see that in lots of different banks, um, mm -hmm. if you we compete against each other, we're working at cross purposes with each other. We almost are shooting ourselves in the foot. And I have seen that in so many banks over time. So I think we, we focused on that to an extent that made us qualitatively different from other organizations. Mm -hmm. And that enabled us to do a much better job of supporting our clients because clients felt that, that, um, that the whole bank was behind the individuals they were working with. And the truth is the whole bank was, and they also felt like we were focused on their success as much, if not more than we were focused on our own, because we, we encouraged our employees to, if they were ever at a at a juncture in the road where going one way would make a lot of money for the bank, but wouldn't help the customer that much, um, maybe even would have a detrimental effect. Or if the other road would result in the customer being more successful, even though it maybe didn't earn as much money for us, our our employees knew which road to take. And it was always what's good for the customer and they knew that the whole bank would support them. Mm -hmm. And that's a culture that I personally feel um, you, it's hard to find. You can find people who pretend that they're doing that. Um, but even that is 
harder to find than <laughs> other options. Well, it's definitely hard to scale, right? So, I mean, as the bank get bigger and bigger, I mean, did did these did these cultural norms become harder and harder to uh, kind of enforce and, and implement? Like, how do you how do you scale these things? Because at some point you start falling back on you know KPIs and metrics and you know formal performance reviews and and um, you know commissions and, and that sort of stuff. So how do you how do you scale it? Um, once you move beyond the kind of family size? Well, uh, first of all, I, my experience has been somewhat different from what your uh, question implies, meaning I think that the challenge in scaling it has um, less to do with KPIs um, and more to do with the speed of growth. And I think this is one of the problems that Silicon Valley Bank probably had in the past three or four years. This is my theory. It's hard to prove it because I wasn't there for one thing. Um, but when you're growing too quickly, Silicon Valley Bank actually uh, went from just a few thousand, maybe three, 4,000 um, employees to about 8,500 in a handful of years, the most recent four or so years. And I think the asset base grew even even more, right? Right. Well, there were two things that drove that. One was that the asset base drove uh, grew so quickly. Um, and the um, actually, technically, it's the liability base because mm -hmm. in banks, deposits, right. liabilities, loans are assets. The loans didn't mm -hmm. grow that fast, but the deposits grew really fast in that four year period. We went from probably 40 or 50 billion up to 250 billion at the high point. Um, and that requires a, a lot more employees um, to manage those, but it also um, uh, involves hiring a lot of employees because regulators um, like us to have a lot of people focused on risk. So we ended up bringing in, I say we, even though I wasn't there because I still identify with it. The bank ended up bringing in literally a couple thousand employees that were focused on risk management in those uh, last four years or so. And the problem is how do you acclimate those employees quickly? If you're growing your employee base five or 10% a year, you can enculturate those employees help them to understand the culture and to admire the culture and embrace it and make it a part of themselves. But if you're bringing in 25% of your, a new 25% of your employee base every year, the, the task of enculturating people is insurmountable. You can't do it. And that's what, what I think had a potentially a negative impact on the culture. But um, I think you could have a culture like the one I described with 8,500 employees mm -hmm. if you had brought them in slowly enough over time to enable you to enculturate them properly. Right. I mean, I think it's funny, risk management. I mean, that seems to be what uh, I know this goes beyond your your term at, the, at Silicon Valley Bank. But, you know, when I heard about the events related to the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, you know, I and some of my colleagues were kind of stunned because, you know, I teach a course on banking and we, we spend the first three weeks on duration gap management, you know, hedging interest rate risk. Like that's what we spend literally the first three weeks of, you know, an undergraduate class on, on bank management. And, and so, you know, one of the things that I always wondered was, you know, were there people, and again, I know you can't comment on this, but, but it seems like one would think there would be people in the bank kind of, you know, pulling the alarm cord and, 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 uh, you know, saying, Hey, we, we, you know, there's smoke here and we've got some problems. Um, so do, do you think, I mean, how do you maintain those channels? So how do you create the culture where if people see something, they say something, right? You know, if you see a problem, you, you speak up about the problem. You know, if you, if you have a concern and a worry, you not only know where to go with it, but you have the courage to kind of go there with it, even if it means kind of rocking the boat. Yeah, you're making an excellent point. And before I actually give you the my answer to that question, let me just mention one small thing that you might find amusing, given that you teach banking, apparently, 
And that is um, the course that I enjoyed the most 40 years ago at the Harvard Business School was um, Charlie Williams' course on banking. And at the time, he was very, very well known. Probably nobody even knows his name today. Uh, he was an, an uh, elder uh, uh, retired banker who taught the commercial banking course for several years into his dotage, I think. And one of the things he would do is he would walk around the, you know, we have those 90 people sections talking and he would suddenly, he did this at least once every session. He would suddenly stop in his tracks, pivot on his heels turn around and point at some person and was at least or once me, I know, point at you and say, you, if you grow your bank more than 10% a year, you're in for a calamity. Never grow faster than 10%. And you'd think, oh, holy shit. I've got to be really careful here. He knows me, <laughs> yeah. even though he didn't. But um. I, he's kind of emerge. He's going to emerge from the grave. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> come after, come after all the Silicon Valley bank. My entire banking career, every yeah. time I would push for growth. But anyway, to go back to your point, how do you go about that? And given that you teach banking, you know about the first line of defense and the second line of defense and the third line of defense. There are multitudinous lines of defense in a well-run bank. So, the first of all, if this a, a decision like the one that brought down the bank, which again had nothing to do with lending and nothing to do with the business model. It was all about what do we do with all those excess ass, uh, 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 deposits? Now, um, at the risk of patting myself on the back here, I know that in my era we had a plan for that. If you were a startup and you brought us a hundred million dollars, we would say, well, let's put five or ten or fifteen on our balance sheet, and let's take the other eighty or eighty-five and put them in third-party money market mutual funds for you. Um, it won't be on our balance sheet, that's true, but you'll, it'll, it'll serve you well because- Well, now you, now you have the reverse repo option, which yeah. is even, even easier, right? Even easier, that's the, and there was a period when we were contemplating that too. I don't know what happened, but I, I, I honestly am not sure how that changed um, after um, I left. But it did change, and we the bank started putting all those assets on their balance sheet. That was clearly a management decision. Um, it would have emanated from the top. The other thing is that the decision then to invest, and this is the crucial point here, the decision to invest a, a large, a significant portion of those excess deposits in longer-term treasuries was the fatal decision. Yeah. That's what brought down the bank, of course. And I think we all understand that if if interest rates go down, those securities, those long-term securities, uh, government bonds will be worth more, and you'll be you'll look even smarter. But if interest rates rise, um, their value will go down, and you're going to end up having a loss, and mm -hmm. you'll look like you made a huge mistake, which is what happened. So how did they do that? Because the normal procedure would be. This decision would be made by the CFO, and the CEO should be looking at that and saying to the CFO, um, you know, that's not a good idea. We shouldn't do that. But if that didn't happen, there was a group called ELCO, the Asset Liability Committee, consisting of senior people in the bank. ELCO should have caught it and said, that's not a good idea. And if ELCO missed it, there's always the finance committee of the board yeah, and they should have caught it. And I don't know what the finance committee of the board was like in that era because I was, or I've been gone now for a number of years, but the finance committee of the board, when I was there, can, had at least a couple of people that would have caught that. And not only that, they wouldn't have been terribly kind about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and of course, the Fed is the, the Fed is the final, uh, you know, uh, safety. Yes, uh, and that's I'd like to speak to that too. I, I don't want to enrage people at the Fed, um, but I think they let us down. 
because yeah. they say that they that they um, uh, raised concerns, and I'm sure they did. But at least when I was CEO, my memory of working with the Fed was if they raised concerns, you had to fix them immediately, and if you didn't, your head was on the chopping block. So. In my view of regulators, when I was in that um, situation years ago, was even when they're wrong, they're right. Mm -hmm. um, and I, in a sense, I meant that because I see one bank, they see hundreds. So they probably know more than I do. And number two is, there's no, you can't take the Fed to court. You can't say, I don't like the decision, so I'm suing you. You have to do what they tell you and mm. they would otherwise, you know, line you up and shoot you. So I can't figure out when the Fed says they advise the bank and the bank didn't respond. I don't I don't buy that. They can Fed can always make the bank respond. So I'm baffled by that. Think about that. CFO makes a bad decision. And it's not caught by the CEO. It's not caught by the management team. It's not caught by ELCO. It's not caught by the finance committee of the board. And ultimately, it's not stopped by the regulators. I don't understand it. Yeah, I mean, particularly, I mean, in, in my class, you know, we, we, we talk about Orange County. And we talk yeah. about the SNL crisis. And we talk about Lehman Brothers. And, and, uh, and all of those are stories where, you know, you have these, these big, duration gaps uh, and, and, you know, people are caught uh, flat footed. So, you know, if those stories are rattling around in your brain, you know, it could just be that it's, it's one of these frogs in, in the pot, right? Where, you know, you, you make a small move and then you make another move. And then, you know, before you know it, you find yourself in this situation. But I wanted to um, ask you, there's another fantastic image or metaphor in the book, which is this idea of dog sleds versus orchestras. Now again, I, am I going to have to cite Ken Wilcox when I when I use this this image in my class, or or, or is there is there a, is there another source for this image? No, uh, there's no copyright on it. There's a copyright on the book, obviously, but the image. I'll tell you where I got the image, and that is that um, I think about um, ten years ago, my wife and I were traveling. We met in our travels this uh, young guy from Denmark. He's about I think he was probably 25 years old at the time. And we got to talking with him and uh, we were fascinated by his story. He said that he's in the um, special forces of the Danish military and his job was patrolling Greenland. And I thought that is the weirdest thing I've ever heard. Why would you patrol Greenland? Well, it turns out, you know, Denmark's a small country with a relatively large population given its size, you know, six or 7 million people. Greenland is huge, and has only a few hundred thousand, probably under a million people. But it's, it's, we suspect, or everybody believes that it has a lot of natural resources. So the Danes are worried that the Russians will grab it. Therefore, they, they have these dog sleds that uh, traverse Greenland uh, 365 days a year. And they have what they call a, a, a kind of special force that is responsible for this. So here, the point to the story though was he said, you know, these dog sleds, they look like beautiful things. It looks like all these dogs are working together on a very harmonious team. But the truth is, he says, when we, when we bunk down at night in our tents, we have to tether them 30 feet apart uh, to feed them because otherwise they'll kill each other. Because every dog wants to move up the chain and ultimately, they want to be the lead dog. Mm -hmm. and first of all, that just amazed me. But secondly, I started thinking, hey, that's just like some of the banks I worked in before <laughs> at the Silicon Valley Bank. And it was then that I said, you know, we need a metaphor to help people understand the way we would like them to work together. And the orchestra came to mind because it's probably not a perfect metaphor, but at least it uh, it contains some of the essential ingredients. You know, there you've got 100 plus people who come together to either practice or to perform. And they may have petty animosities and they may be competitive, but they set that aside in order to play from the same sheet. 
in harmony for the benefit of their customers, which happened to be the people sitting in the audience. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was such a way I use that metaphor. We are my entire team ended up using that metaphor multitudinous times and people embraced it. They, they seemed to understand it. It seemed to resonate. And I remember we used to end with um, in describing that uh, metaphor, we used to end with, and you know, even the triangle has a note to play. Mm -hmm. Right. Now you have a couple other wonderful things. I mean, you've got this, um, you know, ninth guiding principle. <laughs> you could talk about that. You've got the, the, the four D's of, of meetings uh, and you've got the, the bud to boss program. Maybe, maybe we can, uh, you know, how important is it that an organization have defining principles? I mean, we have at, um, at Berkeley Haas, right, we have these four defining principles and pretty much every student, faculty, staff member, alum can kind of, kind of rattle them off. We used to hand out these cards with, with the defining principles on them. And, and I thought it was a fantastic exercise because if you don't have your culture kind of you know, it's not, there's the oral tradition, obviously, but sometimes it's, it's good to have some, some f things that you can reference. And, you know, Amazon has its 14 principles, which is probably too many, you know, but, but, um, but, you know, what, what's the, what's the importance of being very explicit and articulating your, your cultural uh, norms and principles? Yeah. And let me, I'd say three things in response to that question. Number one is it's not just a question of are articulating them. You need people to internalize them. And people don't internalize things unless they, the words come out of their own mouths and not out of yours. So we would, on a regular and ongoing basis, year in, year out, have discussion groups where people would talk about one or the other of the principles and give their own version of why mm -hmm. it was important and how it helped them satisfy customers. Um, so it's really important that people internalize them. The other thing is that um, 14 is way too many. Most people can't remember more than about three things, mm -hmm. um, including me. And <laughs> so when I got to be CEO, we had eight principles. <clears throat> and I realized, first of all, that they were too many. Nobody could remember them. And the other thing was they were kind of like, you know, they were all just be nice principles. Mm -hmm. and so they ran together they weren't distinct so we settled on just um a few and but prior to our settling on just a few which ended up being four i think it was still probably one too many um somebody once said to me in a, a conversation i remember this guy and i were traveling uh to see customers and he said to me you know I'm so angry right now because I just learned that so-and-so is talking about me behind my back and saying negative things. Yeah. And he said, we need a ninth one. That was when we still had eight before we changed that. He says, we need a ninth one. The ninth guiding principle. What is it? Don't talk behind people's backs. And I thought, you know, that's really a good idea. So before we reduced um, eight to four, we actually expanded eight to nine. And we worked on that one for a long time. We explained to people, look, at, if you're annoyed with somebody, you're, I'm annoyed with Greg. I have an obligation to go to Greg and talk with him, you know, politely, but constructively and forthrightly and say, listen, Greg, we have a disagreement here. We got to talk this through. Um, this isn't personal, but it's not going to work when we're on different pages. And the truth is nobody does that. I don't do it either, mm -hmm. <laughs> typically, because your first response, if you're mad at Greg, the first your first inclination is to call Mary and say, Mary, Greg's a jerk, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> and you hope Mary says yes, and then you think I'm vindicated because both Mary and I think Greg's a jerk. But that makes the situation worse. That politicizes an environment and makes it that much more difficult for people to work with each other. So. Um, that's what that was all about. Now, even if you have to talk to them through a, the sock puppet, I have to get back to the sock puppet because, you know, <laughs> you, you, you got you to gotta tell that story. I mean, it, it's uh, I thought it was something out of a, 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 
you know, out of a movie. I mean, maybe it should be in a movie. Um, <laughs> it was one of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen, but and it was so funny I couldn't forget it. But it was under our, uh, my predecessor, and my predecessor was not as receptive as I think he should have been to other people's ideas. He loved other people's ideas as long as they were identical to his own. So at one point, excuse me, we had a, um, a meeting among ourselves, the people on the management team, and I was on it at that time. And we said, you know, there are certain things we want him to do differently. But everybody was afraid to tell him. <laughs> so we got one guy who was the head of HR to tell him. And his, the way he went about it was he did it in a meeting with all of us present. But he put on a sock puppet and he acted like a ventriloquist <laughs> and told the boss what we were, what our dissatisfactions were. And it, it was one way to get through. And it, it, to the other person, it was so humorous he couldn't really get mad. Yeah, so I guess I mean humor can be can be helpful in, in getting past the those the resistance. Um, and I have to ask you, look, the, what about the the four Ds? I, I I love the four Ds. I mean these these kind of mnemonics, right? That that kind of help guide you. Uh, I oftentimes they're find that they're more helpful than you know, academic articles that, 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 uh, that explain things, um, because you can kind of walk around with them. You know, when I, I know when I talk to students who have graduated from business school many years later, they, they can kind of, you know, rattle off some, some, some short, you know, handy mnemonics, but, but, you know, if you have them in the back of your mind, they're, they're super helpful. So I, I thought this was, this was useful when trying to figure out, you know, in the moment, what, what are you trying to do, right? we talk about how companies have way too many meetings and uh, you know, I've actually seen proposals where every time you call a meeting, you've got a, you've got a dollar bill attached, right? So, you know, the CEO's time is worth this many thousands of dollars and an hour and you know, everybody else's. And so every time you call the meeting in, in zoom, it says, Oh, this is going to be a $50,000 meeting. Are you sure you really want, <laughs> you know, spend $50,000 on this issue? But um, but how do you make the most out of these 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 meetings using this four D principle? Okay, um, the four D principle. I'd like to think I invented that because I think I did, but I I, I suspect there are other people who think they did too. Uh, so I, I when I uh, the early in my tenure tenure as CEO, I l learned through some book about um, Cyrus the Great, and nobody really knows what he did, how he ran things, because it was a couple thousand years ago. But there is a, some some block of stone on which is edged, etched, rather, excuse me, etched um, a diversity in council, unity in action. And I thought about that and thought about it and turned it into the four Ds. And the idea is, first, we discuss things. So I'm the CEO. I have a big decision to make. It's not one I've delegated down. It's one of those rare big ones. I pull together the team and say, I want to discuss this with you because I want your opinions because your opinions will help me make a good decision. I'm going to make the decision. We're not going to vote. Um, so don't, don't think it's going in that direction. But I really need your input. And if you don't give me your input, your honest input, I'll be disappointed because I depend on it, on your input to help me. So I understand all the ramifications of whatever it is I decide to do. Um, and then we have a discussion. So the first D is the discussion. And it can last as the CEO or the head of the meeting, because this can happen at multiple levels. The head of the meeting uh, is the one who gets to decide how long the discussion's got to be. And you develop a feel for it. It's got to be long enough, but not too long. And uh, that's the first D. The second D is the decision. And that's made by the the person in charge. Uh, and that, I don't know how long that takes, but it's, you know, in comparison, much short, much shorter duration. The third uh, D is delivery, which means executing on the decision. And the fourth D takes place at some point in the future. That's debriefing. That's periodically you should pull people together and say, 
let's evaluate the decision we made in light of what's happened in the past six months or year or two years and decide whether or not it was a smart thing. And if it wasn't, we'll revise it. But here's where you, you get caught up. There are two big pitfalls, potential pitfalls. One of them I've already addressed, and that is you got to have people that uh, in your discussion group who are um, capable of having adult-like discussions. You can't have bullies. You can't have passive-aggressive people. That's number one. And the, the, the presiding person, in this case, the CEO, can't be so dominant that people just sit there trying to guess what he or she thinks and mimic it. Uh, but the other problem is this, and that is people get really confused. Hold it. We want diversity in, during the discussion, mm -hmm. but during the execution, we want unity. And that's a big problem for them because they get confused and they start uh, during the delivery, the execution, continuing to disagree. Yeah. And you can't let that happen. You've got to, uh, you've got to make it very clear. I want your opinion during the discussion. When we're executing, you have to get on the bus. And if you if you have a different opinion and you can't accept the presiding opinion, you better get off the bus because we can't have uh, sabotage, which is ultimately what it amounts to. And I remember during those very, very big decisions at the beginning of my tenure, the, the ones I mentioned to you, uh, strategic decisions that we were going to get rid of two thirds of the bank and only focus on technology, take that one. That's a huge decision. I welcome the discussion, but when we actually executed on it, we couldn't have people balking or sabotaging, and it looked like it was happening. So I called in some business school professor. I can't actually remember what it, that person's name was, but he was a smart guy. It was, um, we were, you know, only a couple of miles from Stanford, so we went over to see this guy and he said, well, if you really want to succeed, you have to make it clear to the people that don't like that decision that this is a, uh, an important um, turning point for them. And they either have to agree to support you or they have to leave. And the result was a couple of people had to leave. Yeah, Amazon, I think, has the disagree but commit, they say. Yeah. And, you know, I found, I, I came up, I discovered this idea because at universities, it's super frustrating because, you know, universities, they oftentimes confuse, right, the participation in a conversation and a decision, right? So, you know, what we'll do is we'll often have decisions get made under the cover of night, <laughs> Right. And then you have the feedback session after the decision is made. And, and so, you know, I, I remember asking like, why, why aren't you asking for feedback before you make the decision? And they're like, oh, well then we have to satisfy more people. Right? It's like, no, no, you don't, no, you don't, you know, you, know, you don't like the, the, asking somebody their input is not offering them, you know, a, 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 a vote or, or a, a veto, right. It's just kind of soliciting information. So, so I think, Maybe people think that if they are asked their opinion, then they, they expect that it's going to be accepted rather than simply listened to. And so you have to be very, very clear about that. Yeah, I think there's you have problems on both sides of the table, meaning if if the leader asks the group their opinions, the people in the group um, uh, may think they're voting. And yeah. that's a problem. The other side of the coin is many leaders don't like asking other people's opinions because they feel, gosh, if I ask you your opinion and I don't accept it, you're going to sabotage me. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't work on either side when people take those. Yeah. Things. And if you make a decision first and someone comes in and says, oh, we don't like that. Say, oh, well, you know, oh, I wish I knew that before, but. You know, we've already made a decision, right? so, you know, um, well, last thing I want to ask you about is uh, China, right? So you've got a new book on, on 
China, and you talk a lot, a little bit in, in this book about your experiences in, in China. And, you know, China was open and receptive to investment, right, for many years, um, open to tech companies and open to industrial companies and CPG companies. And um, they kind of pulled back on that openness after, after a while. But, you know, f- the financial sector is 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 sort of a, it's you know it's highly regulated it's 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 a sector all on its own what made you think that silicon valley bank could come in there and play ball in in china when the sector itself was just so highly regulated and controlled by the state yeah i have to admit i was stupid <laughs> <laughs> I what it, how it works and I'm I'm going to overgeneralize, but I firmly believe what I'm telling you. And that is that um, I don't actually think things have changed that much. There are people who say, oh yeah, they were much more receptive 10 years ago and now they're less receptive. I actually don't think that's true. I think things haven't changed, but they're um, just behaving slightly differently in the way they go about it. But my own view is this, um, and this is based on living there for four years and um, trying to um, build a joint venture bank. Uh, the joint venture bank was 50% owned by Silicon Valley Bank and 50% owned by a Chinese bank, which is in turn 100% owned by the government. So it's really we were having a joint venture with the government Um, and there's no getting around it. Yeah. That's what it was. It was 50% us, 50% the Chinese government. And the other thing is, guess what? Silicon Valley bank doesn't rule China. The government in China rules China. So it doesn't actually make any difference how, what percentage we owned. I thought we were brilliant because we negotiated up to 50 and we could have owned 75. It wouldn't have made any difference. The Chinese government, rules in China. Foreigners don't. So, but there's a pattern in my estimation that applies to most companies that go there, particularly companies doing anything important. I mean, if you're going there to set up a factory to manufacture spatulas, nobody's going to bother you because that's not important and you can make money. Um, I think, um, but what the way it works is, and this is how how um, I explain my own receptivity to the concept of going over and building this joint venture, is that the Chinese government finds you, and they say to you, "You know what? We love your bank. It's an amazing bank. It's it's the most. And I'm you think I'm exaggerating? These words were uttered. Trust me." by high ranking people. Your bank is amazing. It's the most amazing bank in the world. We want you here. We need you because we're trying to build an innovation economy and you know how to do it. So we want you here and we'll, we'll make sure that you get the opportunities you want and that you get the licenses you want in order to do business. That's step number one. And if you're like 99% of us, um, uh, you say to yourself, wow, man, that's special. I have to capitalize on that. I have to take advantage of it. What you don't realize is that uh, this is, um, they say that to everybody, (laughs) that they want to come over and you can't take it that seriously. Then the next step is um, you're encouraged to come, you come, They say, um, you know, um, one thing we didn't really emphasize, but it's important, you have to have a joint venture partner. Um, And it's for your benefit because it'll enable you to make progress more quickly. But don't worry, we've got one for you. We found one. So you're hooked up with your joint venture partner. The next step in the process is, oh, oh, it's so wonderful. You've worked so hard and now we can give you the licenses you need. However, there's 
there's one thing we didn't emphasize, and maybe we should have, but you won't be able to use Chinese currency for three years because that's just a rule we've had for a long time, and you can't. It's so hard for us to change rules. Uh, so for the next three years, you won't be able to use Chinese currency. But don't worry, we'll subsidize you. We'll help you stay afloat. You still won't make ends meet, but you won't lose a lot. And then finally. After the three years, <laughs> they come to you and they say, the happiest day of our lives. We're happy. You're happy. You get to use Chinese currency now. But there is one th other thing. We would like you to, to we, we admire your business model so much that we're going to start one of our own, just like yours. But it's going to be 100% Chinese, not 50% Chinese. And, you know, we were 50%, our joint venture was 50% American in name only. All the employees mm -hmm. were Chinese, save one or two out of hundreds. All the customers were Chinese. Uh, and they were, in effect, in a position to make any decision they wanted because we're on Chinese soil. But they wanted one that was 100% Chinese. And... There are a few aspects of your business model we don't quite understand yet, even after three years of watching you. Uh, so would you mind taking out a few hours and spend it with our the new management team of the new bank that's opening next week? This is literally all true. I'm yeah. not making any of it up. And uh, explain some of the things they don't quite get yet. But now it seems if, you, if you're making, if, if something is like intellectual property, right? Some yeah. technique, right? Manufacturing technique. Then it's relatively easy for the joint venture partner to kind of walk away with that secret sauce. But it seems like the secret sauce of Silicon Valley Bank is, you know, no matter how much time they spend observing you and, uh, you know, trying to copy you, I mean, it, it doesn't seem like it's the kind of thing that you can just, you know, cut and paste and drag and drop, right? I mean, the cultural piece in particular is one where, it, you know, that that's hard to copy. So, I mean, were there any kind of secrets into the secret sauce that they were ultimately able to, to replicate? I mean, it doesn't, it seems like the model's just not, not one that, 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 that is compatible with the state owned Chinese banking system. A very insightful comment on your part. Um, I agree fully. And I don't think they did a good job of copying us because I don't think they've been able to replicate. But there are so many cultural differences. There are so many differences in the structure of the economy that it never would have worked anyway. But mm -hmm. you have to be there for a long time before you figure that out. And uh, you're right. They can't replicate it. Um, for a long time, they thought we had an algorithm. For a long time, they thought that we had an algorithm that enabled us to figure out which startups would be successful and which ones wouldn't. And one day, about a year into it, uh, my conversation partner came to me and said, you know, we're really disappointed in you. We've, we've exhibited all this trust and you've lied to us. I have? <laughs> yes, you haven't disclosed the algorithm. <laughs> well, I said, we don't have an algorithm. I'm sorry. But the way this works, it's pattern recognition. And we train our bankers for like 10 years before we let them make decisions on their own. So there is no algorithm. And they were so annoyed by that. They <laughs> couldn't think I was telling the truth. They were pretty much sure there was an algorithm hidden and they just had to squeeze it out of us. But there is no algorithm. And but the other issue is, um, and there are at least 10 others, but I'll mention one other there um, that's really important. And that is that one of the things that helped Silicon Valley Bank be so successful was that the thousands of other banks didn't want to do what we did because they viewed it as risky. And in point of fact, it was risky, but we'd figured out how to do it without without taking on too much risk. We, we had the formula, but it wasn't an algorithm. It was a behavior pattern. And, uh, and um, other banks avoided 
entering our market because they didn't want to get themselves into trouble. Because when banks have too many bad loans in the US, the Fed lets them go down. And every year there are banks that disappear. Mostly mm -hmm. bad real estate loans, by the way, not technology, because they, they don't want to do technology. They just do real estate. But um, it, it's dangerous to be a banker in the U.S. unless you know what you're doing, because if you screw up, you're going to go down. In China, no bank ever fails. They're all owned by the government. And so there's there's virtually, now there may be one exception in 40 years of of history here, because First of all, under Mao, there were no banks. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, 40 years ago, rehabilitated the banking system in a way, but they're all state-owned and they never fail. So if a bank, you know what? If, if, so the Silicon Valley Bank debacle of two months ago had taken place in China, what would have happened? The regulators would have come in quietly, probably wouldn't have made the newspapers, they would have um, fired the, um, a couple of people on the management team. They would have installed new people, members of the party for sure. And they would have kept on going. All 8,500 employees would maintain their jobs. And the public wouldn't even be aware that the bank had been quietly recapitalized mm -hmm. by the government. So right, if we one more reason why you, we couldn't have taken this model to China successfully anyway. Right. I think I forget who it was said that, you know, capitalism without bankruptcy is like religion without hell. <laughs> you <laughs> you, yeah. you, you kind of need it anyway. Ken, thanks so much for joining me. The, the book uh, is called leading through culture. It's, it's a great handbook for people, aspiring leaders. Um, and uh, the next book on, on China, uh, hope to read that when it, when it comes out um, and hope to chat again sometime soon. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.